as you said, I'm an independent web developer from Australia, and for a long time I used to work for the Australian government. I'm not exactly sure how long. It felt like about 90 years. <laughs> it wasn't actually that bad, um, but it was a little bit bad, so I quit my job, <laughs> and now I'm here. Um, so yeah, I've spent a lot of time hiking around the world. Uh, this is me after walking 800 kilometers across Spain. Uh, so when I'm not hiking and exploring, I like to experiment with code, and, and you can find some of my half-baked ideas on CodePen or GitHub, uh, and occasionally I write something a little bit more detailed on my blog. I'm on Twitter too if you want to follow me, and it's how I measure my self-worth, so that would be awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, the title of my talk is a CSS eulogy, so I should say thank you all for coming on this very somber occasion. <laughs> now, it's not a eulogy for CSS itself, although the landscape is certainly changing, and that is something that I want to touch on. I don't think we'll be saying goodbye to CSS itself anytime soon. So rather this is a talk about looking critically at some of the patterns and techniques that we've regularly used and asking ourselves, is this the best way or have things moved on? And surprisingly, the answer to that might not always be obvious. Now, I'll be honest with you, it's not going to be easy. Uh, we'll be laying to rest some much loved patterns and designs, things that have served us well over the years. So lean on the people around you. Be prepared to reflect on negative margins Lament your love of gratuitous clear fixes and long for the days of pixel-based certainty. But we'll also be looking to the future and acknowledging Flexbox, viewport units, uh, legacy something that we're constantly dealing with. And as a result of this, we don't always move on as fast as we should. I think we often cling to out outdated techniques, either out of fear or comfort. And I want to tell you that it's okay to not want to let go. In the dying days of IE 6 and 7, despite my personal rocky relationship with them, uh, I still felt, found myself reaching for the comfort of a robust star hack. And to this day, where inline block is concerned, in my heart, Zoom will always be one. And what I'm getting at is, like anything, our habits when writing CSS can become ingrained and difficult to change. This might be even though we know better. So what I think we need is proper acknowledgement of this so that we can all move on and uh, get that well-needed closure. Cherish the memory now as we say goodbye to one of our fondest friends, the clear fix. Well, it's not quite working there, but sorry. Um, now, you all know what I'm talking about when I say a clear fix. It's a hack to make a parent element clear its flow for children. Um, but it's, of course, a very versatile hack, one that underpins a lot of uh, patterns that we use, things like media objects, navigation, grids, and all of that. In fact, we use it so much that we forget it's a hack. But if you've ever had to explain what a clear fix is to someone who doesn't know, you, you might have realized it doesn't really make very much sense. Although it feels like second nature to us, uh, Floats were never meant to be used for solving the majority of layout problems that we asked them to solve. They require hacks like ClearFix to even work in the first place. So why should we have to do this is a perfectly legitimate question. And I think all of us in this room have come to accept that this is the de facto way to solve this problem, no more thinking required. And it's when we get to that point that I think we become close to new ways of thinking and fail to see better options. So before we look at those better options, this is a eulogy, so let's take a quick look at the life an evolution of ClearFix. I mean, it's been good to us, so it feels like the honourable thing to do. And this here is, of course, a primitive ancestor to our modern ClearFix. Or if anyone here has perhaps been to the London Zoo, you might say, Mike, you fool, that's a chimp. This is exactly the kind of nonsense we expect from the colonies. And OK, London, very clever of you. Also very snotty, I might say, but uh, he's a very symbolic chimp. And the reason he's so happy is he's just realised that he can force a container to clear its children by adding an empty div at the bottom with the property clear both. <laughs> it was a simple and, and fairly elegant solution, uh, but it wasn't semantic, and, and dare I say it, real developers don't use empty elements. I feel like I should duck when I say that. <laughs> um, what this chimp didn't realise was that like a fish taking its first evolutionary steps out of water, the next few years were going to be a little bit awkward. And I, I do hope that you'll forgive me for extending that metaphor, but I think you'll agree it was worth it to get these guys on a slide. What I'm not really getting at very well is our early clear fix tricks, they weren't very pretty, they looked something like this. I, I don't want you to read it, I just want you to glance at this with a fond nostalgia. It contains various hacks to target specific browsers, and in each case, these uh, hacks are trying to achieve just one thing, and that is to trigger an internal browser rendering property known as block formatting context, or you might remember has layout in IE. If you don't know what block formatting context is, simply put, it's the devil's magic. 
it's an internal property that we can only trigger indirectly, and it's what all of those hacks were trying to achieve. Clearfix is, is a side effect. Pretty soon browsers lifted their game, and we didn't need all of those ugly hacks. I, I call this one a transitional stage Clearfix. It's not quite as ugly, uh, not quite as scary. In 2011, Nicholas Gallagher improved on this again, and we have the micro Clearfix. Now, if you're using a Clearfix today, it should look something like this. And uh, an interesting point to make about this example is, like the earlier one, we're inserting an empty element at the bottom of a container with the property clear both. The only difference is that this time it's a pseudo element. And I think it can be valuable to reflect on the life and evolution of techniques that we use, because sometimes like this, they point us to the future. All right, so a quick show of hands. Um, who here has used a clear fix in the last year? Nearly all of you. Um, of those of you that put your hands up, who's used it in the context of a dot clear fix utility class or something similar? I'm very pleased to see a lesser number, but uh, I'm sure it's something that we've all done at least once at some point, and it's something that I'm guilty of too. And I'll be willing to bet you my left hand, and this is my left hand if anyone wants to know what they're going to get into. Uh, I bet that this is going to be one technique that we say goodbye to once and for all this year. Now, the reasons I think that firstly is there's better technique layout techniques that don't need clear fix at all. But more importantly than that, preprocessors such as LESS and SAS, and I guess I should include post-CSS now as well, um, in terms of a dot utility class, they offer us tools to get rid of this. Previously, it might have been easier to write the clear fix once in your CSS and then apply the class anywhere in the markup that you needed to use it. Uh, this was obviously faster than writing it in every component when needed. But obviously, mix-ins give us an opportunity to, to do this now. And this is something that I had difficulty letting go of again. Uh, I don't know if you can read that up the back, but um, it kept me up at night wondering whether I should use a mix-in or a utility class. And I'll always have fond memories of this. I used to call this the clear fix shotgun approach. If you don't know how to solve a layout problem, simply clear fix all the things. And it was always a nice surprise to come in in the morning and find that someone had committed this. Uh, it usually happened in large teams with multiple uh, developers. And it wasn't until uh, preprocessors gave us placeholders that we were able to forcefully put an end to this. Now, placeholders differ from regular mix-ins in that they're not written to the final, st final style sheet except where they are used. In general, I think that modern tools like uh, preprocessors uh, are good things to lean on in times of hurt. They'll help you move on, and I think you should do that. So when I first gave this talk to test this theory, I did a little uh, research. Um, I went and visited the blogs and websites of all the speakers and organizers at the conference because, you know, that's a great way to make friends. Um, but luckily, when I was conducting that test, I found that, uh, despite it being very non-scientific, I confirmed that the Clearfix utility class was indeed out of favor. And of about 50 websites I visited, only around five had it. And I might have had a hand in one of those as well. So I hope I've convinced you that you probably don't need a Clearfix utility class. but do we need a clear fix at all? And the answer to that is, depends. Uh, in a lot of situations, there's better techniques that we can use now. Um, and I think it's time that maybe we took a look at some of those examples. So this is the media object. Uh, you've probably all seen this. It, it was popularized by Nicole Sullivan. It's the poster child object oriented CSS. It's been a pretty solid go-to pattern for a number of years. And uh, traditionally, it has an image, uh, a heading, and some text to one side. But apart from the container needing um, a clear fix, you also need a block formatting context on the content, or a left margin equal to the width of the image to prevent the text from wrapping underneath. So I'd often see a lot of examples like this when browsing the interweb. And I'm wondering, how might we rethink this well-known example to get rid of this reliance on uh, magic numbers? And I found a solution by someone called Harry Roberts. Now, I have no idea who he is, but his solution looks pretty good. He wrote about something he calls the flag object. And it's not just a poorly disguised rebranding of the meat. No, it, it is just a poorly disguised rebranding of the media object, let's be honest. But it adds to it with some additional options and versatility. Uh, it's supported as far back as IE8, so if you're supporting legacy, uh, it's an option. Um, but as well as that, you can vertically center the image or align it to the bottom. And because the image extends to the full width of the container, you can have different background colors. And sorry for my terrible color choice there. 
Um, I'm a much better designer these days than when I developed that one. Um, but anyway, it makes use of display table and personally I feel that that's something that uh, is criminally overlooked. I wouldn't use it for outlining, uh, out, out laying out a whole page, but used in moderation in components, I don't see really what the problem is. I think we just sometimes cringe at the word table. Um, but if you're ready, there is a more robust solution uh, that uses Flexbox, and this one's by Philip Walton. So like the flag object, this implementation gives us control over the positioning of the image. Uh, but as well as this, we get something called source order control. This means that we can move it to the left or the right without uh, changing any of our HTML. And all of those alignment options are inherent in Flexbox, and this is really good. This means that we're not relying on uh, hacks and things to uh, make them work. So I'm not going to um, give full detail of all those different techniques, but suffice to say that Flexbox gives us greater control over layout than any of the techniques that we commonly use. And as I said, they're built in. So if you haven't seen Phil Walton's site sold by Flexbox, I strongly recommend that you go and have a look at it after this. It contains that and many other patterns. Um, but for now, let's just take a quick moment's silence to say farewell to Cliffix. We've loved you, and you were there for us when things were tough. You will always have a place in our hearts. But sadly, we no longer need you like we once did. You may be destined to fade into obscurity, but you will not be forgotten. Thank you, Cliffix. But let's not dwell on our sorrow for Clearfix too long because there's other patterns that we need to say goodbye to. And one of those is negative margins. Now, despite their image as a hack, negative margins are well described by the CSS specification and in many cases we use them exactly as was intended. Now, I'm not firing at negative margins in general, but I do think that they tend to be a symptom of uh, poor choices in our CSS. And with more layout options available, I'm finding fewer situations where I actually need them. So one practical example of this and a pattern that we've seen many times, um, one that's probably familiar to you if not quite as comfortable, is modals. Or more generally, positioning anything in the centre of the screen. Uh, it might be a logon box, a message, a dialogue, or you might be asking me to share your article on Facebook before I've even read it. <laughs> and um, of course, if that's what you're doing, you can stop. But uh, there are legitimate reasons for needing a pattern like this. And whilst it might not be as close to our hearts as Clearfix, I think maybe we could quickly take a look at the life and evolution of this pattern. So historically, we might have used an alert or a confirm dialogue. But the problem with these is they were ugly, obnoxious, and we couldn't change a thing about how they looked. So with those limited ob options, understandably, we all just avoided them in favor of custom options. So, oh. Um, <laughs> sorry about this, guys. Um, hang on. Uh, yeah. Actually, let's just do this. All right. Um, right. Now I've lost my speaker notes now. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, mo modals. What we would do is we'd give it an absolute position and a top and, top and left value of 50%. That would move the top left corner into the center of the screen. And to move the center of the element into the center of the screen, we gave it a negative left margin equal to half its width and a negative top margin equal to half its height. So you've all probably seen this. Who here uh, has used this technique before? Is anyone still commonly using this technique? Maybe one hand. That's really good. Um, I still find sometimes that I reach for this just out of habit or comfort. Um, but the problem I have with this technique is that the width height and margins are all magic numbers. And I also find that with responsive design, I'm doing multiple versions of it for um, different screen sizes and maybe an inline version for mobile. But as well as this, there might be situations where I don't know the size of the thing that I need to center or where that should be a percentage. And so this once robust technique is no longer meeting all of my needs. Now, to address that unknown size thing, one of my first inclinations was to try and solve this problem using uh, percentages for negative margins. And of course, that's a problem I only made like a thousand times as, as a less seasoned developer. And it's a simple mistake that uh, you've possibly all made. But percentages for ne where negative margins are concerned are relative to the parent container, not to the element itself. Uh, so that's not really that intuitive. But luckily, this is how CSS transforms work. Unlike negative margins when using translate to position an element, you can say move it 50% move it of its own width or 50% of its own height in any direction. So it's a lot more 
robust and intuitive and no more magic numbers. But, like I said, you've probably, you've probably all seen that technique as well, but this too might be a transitional stage solution. I think that this pattern may also be on the verge of making another evolutionary step. And what I'm talking about is the dialogue element. Now, this is relatively new. Uh, I think it's in Chrome and Opera, but I, it may have recently landed in Firefox. I'm not too sure. Um, there are some polyfills, however, that you can use today, and they're as good as any custom solutions that we use. So I think you can start using this. Um, and the dialog element doesn't require any CSS for positioning. I don't know if you can read it there, but um, it's only got a width in that example. Um, you can override the default positioning, of course, with CSS. Uh, but as well as that, we get native JavaScript methods for interacting with it. No more, no more toggling classes or anything like that. And we get this backdrop pseudo element, which makes it uh, pretty easy to add a background overlay, which you probably know is very hard in CSS. Um, and so here I'll just quickly set it to a beautiful shade of pink. So there you go, that would have been like many lines of CSS prior. So again, in a circle of life kind of way, I feel like this pattern has come back to its origins. We've gained full control over the presentation with CSS, but just like the alert and confirm dialogues, we're back to a uh, native, uh, sorry, a semantic representation of a dialogue with native JavaScript methods for interacting with it. And this is how it often goes. We, we have a problem that doesn't quite meet our needs and we bend it and we break it. Sometimes hacks are born, things like clear fix, but occasionally a new element, like the dialogue, is born. So, goodbye negative margins. Our relationship was one of necessity, but you made so many things possible. And whilst this might be goodbye, it could, however, be a chance to reacquaint ourselves with some patterns whom, thanks to your hacky ways, we may have lost our spark. Now, the final farewell I want to mention today is the shake-up that viewport units are going to give some of our topography and layout best practices. So viewport units have been around since 2012. In fact, IE was an early mover and they're supported as far back as IE9. Viewport units are really easy to understand. It's basically 1% of the viewport. So there's four types of viewport units. Viewport, uh, VW, which is viewport width. VH, which is the viewport height. Vmin, which is the width or height, whichever is smaller, and Vmax, which is the width or height, whichever is larger. So that's pretty intuitive. So I think that the reason viewport units are not used more often isn't due to a lack of developers' understanding or browser support, but rather more down to the lack of control that designers have, and, and maybe specifically over things like font size. So you might have thought that we said goodbye to pixel-based font sizes in the late 2000s, and we largely did. We favoured EMs and percentages because uh, pixels don't change according to user preferences, and this is bad for accessibility, if not just rude. But pixel-based topography wasn't quite dead. It was just lurking in the shadows and waiting for the days when browsers offered zoom to enlarge text. And with this, some developers decided that the accessibility concerns of pixel-based fonts were no longer as much of an issue. That debate still rages, but the truth is, whether you're using EMs, REMs, or percentages, these are all just abstractions of a base font size, and we usually know that to be 16 pixels. So we've never really had to give up complete control. But viewport units are different. They represent an evolutionary leap, a fundamental change in approach. For the first time, we have true responsive topography. Viewport units are not relative to the base font size in any way, and I think that's what scares some people. This means goodbye to clunky responsive type techniques like this. And the problem with examples like this is that they're jumpy, they require multiple media queries, and they don't necessarily resize in proportion to other elements on our page. This means that they can jump out of containers, trigger overflow, cause all kinds of mess. It's like feeding a gremlin after midnight. And honestly, I don't know why we persisted with this method of responsive topography for so long. Or avoiding some of these problems, and we can limit uh, the scaling by only applying viewport units above a certain screen size. Uh, we could also use calc, and this example says set the font size at a viewport width of zero to exactly 16 pixels, so that's a little bit more precise, and then scale at a rate of three viewport widths from there. Um, so yeah, there's still limitations, but there's, there's ways to hack around them again. But when I was preparing this talk initially, I was thinking about some of those limitations, and whilst we can limit scaling with media queries and calc, we still don't have full control. So we're essentially uh, not over multiple uh, viewport widths anyway. We're limited to whatever three viewport widths was in the previous example, 
at any screen size. Without another media query or a change in the font size, we can't change it, to, for example, to 32 pixels at an 800 pixel resolution. Like every eulogy you've ever been to, this one ends with a closing rant. Now that we've had a detailed look at the life and evolution of a few patterns, as well as some of the hacks we've used to get around uh, those limitations, I hope you've realized a familiar theme. Our hacks are usually just clever workarounds for the limitations of CSS, and in most cases, those limitations relate to layout. And that's because CSS was not designed for solving layout problems. It was designed for adding simple styles to HTML documents. In fact, not even necessarily HTML documents. XML was still a viable option then. Thank you.